everyone. I am here with Artur Yakimovic. Artur is co-founder at Artificial Intelligence for Life Sciences and a visiting scientist in the lab for molecular cell biology at University College London. Artur, welcome to the Twimmel AI podcast. Hello, Sam. It's a pleasure. Uh, it's great to have you on the show, and I'm looking forward to our chat. Uh, you know, let's get started with a little bit about your background. You are uh, very active in trying to bring these two streams together, AI and, and life sciences. You know, what's the origin of, of that interest? Um, uh, that's a great question. Uh, so uh, I guess, uh, you know, uh, by, my, my entire background is essentially highly interdisciplinary. I, I uh, did my undergrads uh, in uh, chemistry. Then I decided that I'm very interested uh, to learn uh, where does uh, chemistry stop and biology starts. So I d went on to do a PhD in virology and computational biology. Uh, and uh, computers and computer science was always a you know great interest for me. And I was always uh, thinking about, well, you know, could we could probably do more and better uh, in biology in general and, you know, uh, spearhead the discovery if we use a little bit more computers there. So uh, after uh, after finishing my PhD, I did a short uh, postdoc at a University uh, Hospital in Zurich, uh, and uh, I was working on on um, um, in the in the department of microbiology, uh, working on uh, bacteria and computer vision uh, algorithms. And after that, I moved on uh, to do uh, another longer postdoc at uh, University College London, uh, the, the postdoc I, I just recently uh, finalized. Okay, cool. And you said something interesting in there. You wanted to see where chemistry stopped and biology finished, and that led you to studying viruses. What's... Uh, what about viruses kind of characterizes that that edge uh unlike any other you know number of biological processes that are also fundamentally chemical uh that's a great question thanks so um in principle you know there's a there's a big uh, philosophical discussion whether vir viruses are dead or alive uh mm. i think personally uh <laughs> and that's that's that might start a huge conversation in the in the follow up of the show but i think i think personally that they are undead uh so uh undead as Absolutely. in vampires and zombies and the like? Well, think about that. Uh, viruses technically are alive only once they are inside of a host cell. So okay. at any time uh, between that, they uh, don't show any uh, signs of being alive. So mm -hmm. in that sense, they can be classified of, of, as uh, either uh, alive or dead at any time, uh, apart from any specific uh, circumstances. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they're different from other compounds in that once they are inside of a host, they start to do things that we associate with being alive, like uh, reproduce and metabolize and all these other things. Absolutely. So they're not like some inert catalyst. Exactly. Yeah. And they are very complex systems uh, that are able to self-replicate and uh, uh, you know, uh, go on with their lives uh, for only that long uh, as the host is alive. Mm. Uh, and so after uh, you, you, I mentioned you're co-founder of uh, an organization, Artificial Intelligence for Life Sciences. Uh, it sounds like it's a consortium is probably not the right word, but it's an organization along those lines and that you're trying to bring folks together and start conversations. Uh, tell us a little bit more about what you're up to there and your goals. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks a lot. Uh, so uh, the the uh, artificial intelligence for life sciences is essentially just a, a platform bringing together uh, people from life sciences, uh, academics, uh, and uh, anyone who is interested in life sciences in any way uh, and bringing Can you people- platform like platform like Facebook or- um, we we use multiple uh, not so not channels. a technology platform, just a, uh, an organizational yeah, yeah. platform. More, more like a more like a organizational platform. 
We s- simply bring people together uh, and provide them with means uh, like, uh, you know, a, a simple forum, an exchange of uh, data, um, a chat where they can, you know, uh, exchange opinions and uh, ask uh, for some technical help or maybe some clarifications and stuff like that. So uh, our main uh, page, if you look at it, essentially is a forum. Uh, where we try to uh, discuss things, do journal clubs, uh, look at papers, uh, share code, uh, share solutions, and so on. So uh, the organization itself is is aimed as a as a community uh, interest company, a non non for profit organization, and the the uh, the core idea behind it is essentially uh, to bridge the the massive massive divide that exists between life sciences and and computer science or artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, the divide is constantly growing, and uh, as as AI progresses, things become more and more difficult to get into. And we're trying to kind of bring the the value that uh, advanced AI can uh, can can give to life sciences and to scientific discovery. And, and why is it that you think that AI gets more difficult to get into for? Uh, folks in the life sciences, it seems like as the field progresses, um, you know, different approaches become commoditized, the tools are becoming commoditized, and the barriers to entry in a lot of ways are um, are falling. Uh, that certainly is the case. Uh, however, uh, let's say um, many... Uh, problems that that uh, are getting commoditized are uh, still not the same problems that life sciences is looking on so uh, in life sciences you quite often uh, try to uh, do things in a little bit more of a broader fashion where you try to bring in several methods showing the same thing whereas in computer science you quite often try to look at the same problem over and over and over again using uh, a, a variation of as you know like you, you, you define those canonical problems like uh, facial recognition and uh, semantic segmentation and so on and so on. Uh, whereas in, in life sciences, you're trying to bring all sorts of different kinds of data, DNA sequencing, uh, bioimaging, electron microscopy, this kind of things, in order to kind of show uh, the, the representative problem from a multifaceted view. So in this sense, it's a quite a different uh, way of, of thinking about these problems. And uh, although uh, certain methodologies get uh, more and more commoditized, as as they do uh, so, they certainly become uh, less difficult to, uh, sort of less difficult to apply to the same problem and more difficult to apply to uh, new problems. OK. Um... I've had a number of conversations with with folks uh, on the podcast in the life sciences, and a lot of them have, well, they, they've been fairly varied, but a, a, a good number of them have been focused on microscopy data. And I think that aligns with just the point you were raising that we've made, made uh, so much progress in computer vision recently. Is that one of the the fields or problems that uh, you've been working in? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, definitely. Thanks a lot for manage, uh, mentioning it. Uh, so the uh, microscopy is, and and uh, biomedical imaging in general, is uh, sort of a pinnacle of, of, of the entire uh, quantitative uh, biology. And the way it's it's uh, moving forward, uh, it, it uh, is one of the most sort of digitalized uh, sources of biological data and uh, obviously working with images uh, is getting increasingly uh, more and more um, uh, sort of easier or like I wouldn't say easier probably easier is the wrong word it's getting uh, you're, you're getting uh, a bigger uh, tool set to work with images every day and uh, things are getting drill into that distinction uh, what what's the so you've got you've certainly got a lot of tools, but hopefully the impact of all of these new tools is that they make things easier. But you're not quite ready to say that yet. Uh, 
yeah i think uh, you know quite often it's uh, a little bit of a that's that's uh, hidden again uh, on on the same point that that you uh, raised uh, before uh, as we progress with things like uh, automl and things getting uh, easier and more commoditized suddenly you don't even know anymore uh, what is it that you're looking for are you looking for image classifier are you looking for a segmentation and there's awful loads you need to know about overall image analysis and all these kinds of problem uh, in a histor problems history sort of if you will and computer science background uh, to to uh, move it to the uh, from the uh, idea or uh, an actual biological problem to uh, a computational problem that is then going to be solvable by those uh, commoditized tools. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll come back to kind of some of the broader life sciences, uh, you know, issues, but let's maybe talk a little bit about your particular research interests um you know what did you do for your postdoc and, and what are some of the things you, that you do in your current role right thanks uh, so um in my uh, postdoc i worked in uh, combining uh, deep learning uh, with uh, microscopy as uh, quite specifically super resolution microscopy uh, of uh, viruses uh, so virus uh, particles or like one of the one of the tricky things about viruses altogether is the that probably uh, one of the well, perhaps one of the only thing that that they have in common is that they are called viruses <laughs> and they they're quite different uh, entities altogether depending on the kind of virus they they may be comprised of rna they may be comprised of dna they may be uh uh, large, they may be small. They, they, the size can vary between uh, microns and uh, nanometers. So, like, probably the smallest one is around 20, 30 nanometers. So, uh, it's a vast, uh, huge uh, field uh, with things uh, being very, very fragmented in multiple subfields. So, uh, again, that's uh, coming back to the problem of. Uh, making things more applicable for uh, for uh, computer science methodology, right? If it's certainly not a great idea to have uh, a lot of uh, small data sets rather than one huge uh, data set helping to solve one big problem. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in in this uh, in one of the projects uh, that was, I, I I worked in several uh, papers, uh, in one of the projects I've, I've recently uh, published, we managed to sort of um, explore the space of uh, super resolved uh, virus particles of uh, so called Vaccinia virus. It's a pox virus family. And What's the virus name? Uh, Vaccinia virus. It's the virus that was used as a, a live vaccine for eradication of smallpox. Okay. Um, and um, in this uh, uh, work, we looked at, we used a, a set of different relatively advanced uh, or let's say you could say state of the art uh, neural net architectures for uh, image analysis and uh, image classification to um, solve a number of of day-to-day uh, -day problems virologists face with uh, their their data for example if you've got a, um, a, a micrograph of a, a cell infected by a virus how do you tell whether uh, this tiny little dots that look like Kind of kind of starts are inside of the cell or outside of the cell, and that's uh, in three-dimensional space. So, uh, in in the biological sense, what we managed to show is was that that you can use advanced neural networks uh, to uh, pick this uh, minute uh, signals uh, uh, alterations that occur once uh, the virus is crossing the cellular membrane, so that you could tell that from the uh, virus micrographs uh, by themselves. And uh, you know, one of the interesting sort of um, tricks we we managed to use uh, in in this case, uh, and that's that that's uh, you know advocating for using deep learning for viruses specifically is that we've uh, been multiplexing the the number of data points. Uh, 
uh, through the fact that you would have multiple viruses per one single cell. And since uh, uh, quite often in microscopy, uh, the fixed magnification is uh, way more suitable for uh, cellular size than, than a virus, single virus size. You get uh, way more uh, virus particles in your data set from one single cell. And uh, that, that allowed us to you know, use uh, more advanced um, neural nets and uh, additionally to that we uh, developed a trick what we called uh, mimicry embedding um, which essentially repurposed uh, it's 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 a variation of transfer learning where you simply repurpose uh, things like uh, amnist uh, by just uh, feeding all this potentially not useful uh, representations from uh, handwritten digits and it tr turns out that uh, you know single channel um, of uh, of a viral core looks very similar uh, if you if you project it in a certain way it looks very similar uh, to a handwritten digit so data sets are very similar in this case and that allowed us to sort of avoid the trap of uh, using very high capacity uh, neural nets on uh, relatively shallow data sets and Just so I'm understanding what you're saying here, are you saying that this single channel super resolution microscopy imagery, you're able to do some kind of uh, dimensionality reduction or um, project it into some embedding space and to something that's on the order of uh, an MNIST digit in terms of the number of features or is actually something that is like the digits themselves about this data set that you're working with? It's more coincidental in this case. And uh, it's just the fact that uh, it, if you work in fluorescence microscopy, there's a lot of uh, you know tricky technical things that are already done for you as compared to traditional computer vision. So let's say if you have a, a normal photograph uh, in computer vision, you would need to uh, unmix channels uh, or do some semantic segmentation to avoid to to look at uh, foreground versus background. And mm -hmm. uh, since those were uh, problems uh, in, in, in the field of microscopy for a very long time, a long time ago before we had all these powerful computers and methods. Uh, there was a rather simple uh, physical solution sort of developed for, for, this, for this computer science problem, if you will, where uh, fluorescence functional microscopy uh, use the system of uh, specific uh, specific uh, color illumination and uh, filters to just filter out the light that is not necessary. So you are end, you end up with uh, just looking at the foreground on the black background. And that is uh, quite uh, an interesting um, sort of approach. And it's very, very commonly used, essentially, in microscopy, in fluorescence microscopy. And uh, that's why, you know, uh, when um, in computer science people uh, Quite often, um, we're you know uh, trying to develop a very complex solutions to do the segmentations. Uh, in biology, people were just like, "Oh, we just used a, a you know a, a, a binning or thresholding, as they call it, to just uh, separate up and down, and 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 we're happy we've got our objects here." So uh, that's um, it's uh, there is a difference in mentality in the in both fields, um, and I guess that's what I, what I was uh, alluding to uh, in in my previous points. Mm. Uh, in in past conversations, the issues that I tend to hear about that make traditional approaches to like segmentation easy to apply to um, to this microscopy data are things like occlusion, where you've got you know, whatever your target is, say a virus or a cell, depending on your scale, you've got, because you've got these multiple layers, you can have them stacked on each other and, and things like that. Is, is the, the nature of the problem that you are looking at uh, such that, um, you know, because the viruses, the viri are, are so small relative to the cell that you didn't have that, uh, those types of occlusion issues to deal with or, um, were you, you know, zooming in to able to kind of isolate the, you know, the individual virus uh, entities, or is there is there something else happening there? 
Uh, that's a that's a great question. I'm I'm really glad you asked. Uh, so the thing is that uh, in case of of, of viruses, uh, what we have what we're dealing with uh, quite often is uh, a very um, so we 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 are hitting the uh, so-called diffraction limit of in light microscopy. Uh, so obviously that would and be you can't get small enough to properly resolve the virus. Absolutely. So, and it depends on, it obviously depends on the virus you're working in, but yeah. uh, the virus I was working in and that particular study was um, around uh, 450 nanometers uh, in diameter. And uh, that's as close as it gets basically to being slightly above the diffraction limit, which is about uh, 200 nanometers, depending on the uh, wavelength. Um, and uh, basically that allows to exist at this uh, sort of sub-pixel, a little bit of a structure resolution, and you would maybe be able to see uh, just, uh, to, to see if you get a brighter particle in case it's a, it's a, um, a cluster of, of multiple viruses and, and uh, not, but it's very difficult to get essentially ground truths for that. And we're just moving towards this direction. We're at the limit of, of uh, diffraction, if you will, in uh, virus light microscopy. And that's why we need techniques like super resolution microscopy, which uh, is not to be uh, confused with super resolution in AI. <laughs> it's slightly different. <laughs> right. Uh, I, I'm actually I'm glad you mentioned that because I was uh, wondering about uh, whether there was a relationship between the, the two. Super resolution in AI is tends to refer to taking a, a photo of you know a given resolution and making a higher resolution you know usually generative version of that. Super resolution microscopy is just talking about using very higher you know higher resolution microscopes, or is, is there more to it than that? So essentially, uh, on a physical scale, uh, there is uh, no um, a straightforward way to to bypass the or to to cross the diffraction limit, and uh, several uh, techniques have been proposed uh, uh, in, in the past uh, few decades uh, that are extremely interesting and and extremely successful at the same time, and they um, some of them uh, overlap a lot uh, with uh, computational microscopy techniques where you would essentially uh, try to uh, find inf uh, sources of information uh, to to allow you to uh, cross this limit and compute beyond the diffraction limit um, uh, one of sources uh, of such information could be temporal source, where you could try to unmix individual point sources by making uh, molecule, molecules blink rather than shine at the same time. Um, and uh, another uh, ways to do that would be to uh, temporarily deplete some of the molecules that are shining and uh, make sure that that only a few are shining again. So, but essentially the the trick of uh, super resolution microscopy or difficulty of super resolution microscopy is that um, you uh, that that there that there is different information fundamental information difference between. Um, uh, pixel resolution and spatial resolution. So uh, with a spatial resolution, you're trying to understand if you have one pixel, is this one molecule or two molecules? And uh, with uh, pixel resolution, you can happily you know, create uh, a little bit of structure by, by doubling the, the number of pixels and uh, try to do some prediction there. But essentially, if you don't have enough information on whether it's a single molecule or whether it's uh, two molecules or multiple molecules, then you're a little bit in, in trouble. You're, you don't have enough information. And that's why there are all these clever techniques how to, how to bypass that. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm trying to, to um, resolve all this uh, conversation we're having about the diffraction limit and things like that with uh, these terribly detailed pictures of the you know coronavirus that we're all intimately familiar with now is that just a gigantic massive virus that is easy to resolve or you know how do we produce these you know those images relative to the types of things that we're talking about so uh, one of the uh, classic technique, uh, so I, I would say that that uh, light microscopy, the stuff that I've been talking about, is relatively fresh in virology and uh, 
sort of a bread and butter technique in virology would be electron microscopy. So electron microscopy, okay. so by using electrons rather than photons, you definitely can bypass the, um, the, fraction, the, limit. the fraction limit. Okay. And hence you can uh, get this uh, very detailed um, uh, images of, of, of viruses. But the trouble with electron microscopy in general is that it takes uh, a, a room-sized device and uh, days of uh, sample preparation to, <laughs> to do some work there. So uh, it's a, it's it a also destructive uh, relative here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, you you definitely cannot do this live. Uh, yeah. So there, there's a there is a field uh, in microscopy or in light microscopy called uh, uh, live microscopy or live cell microscopy, where you just uh, essentially do a, a video of of what's going on in the cell uh, mm -hmm. with a different temporal resolution. Mm -hmm. Got it. And so the so the this in, entire project that you were working on was interesting from a life sciences perspective because it was allowing you to resolve things at the level of a virus that um, were kind of at the edge of what you might be able to do with light microscopes. Um, Essentially, yeah, not definitely. particularly impressive for scanning electron microscopes, but just that's a lot more expensive. Uh, and not only that, uh, I mean, uh, in terms of, um, let's say, uh, differences in, uh, there are differences in sample uh, preparations, as you said, right? Uh, sample preparation can be destru destructive and um, the, uh, the entire uh, sort of um, process of, of uh, um, uh, so-called functional microscopy is uh, not as well developed in electron microscopy. By functional microscopy, uh, I mean the um, situation where you can uh, specifically tag the uh, molecule you are interested in. So, in this case, you, in fluorescence microscopy, you're able to uh, know uh, specifically, like, oh, I, you know, I placed a GFP, which is a green flu fluorescent protein, uh, in the uh, uh, capsid of a virus. So I know that if I'm seeing some green spot, that's probably the capsid of a virus, mm -hmm. and that's that's what I mean by functional microscopy, and uh, that's uh, a whole new, different uh, level of techniques. And I think electron microscopy is trying to to get to that level, but it's it's way way trickier. Got it. So there's so in addition to to cost and the the sample prep, there's also just stuff that we know how to do with light that we haven't figured out how to do with electrons yet. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, and so is this work that you're referring to, the um, the work that uh, was recently accepted in the American Society of Microbiology paper, or is this, is that a yeah, different yeah, work? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, uh, fresh stuff of the press. Okay. Awesome, and so in our, you mentioned that that paper also looked at um, the application of caps nets, capsule networks uh, to this problem. Um, and I mentioned when we were chatting earlier that I think this may be the first time I've heard of caps nets being applied in the wild. Uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about your experience using caps nets. Why, why did you, uh, you know, try that route and what kind of results did you see there relative to, you know, CNNs? Uh, yeah, thanks. Absolutely. So uh, the the caps nets, uh, I have to say, they kind of swayed me with uh, the, the whole uh sort of elegancy of the idea. So I decided to try them on and just drop some data on it. And, and, and let's not assume that, that folks are familiar with that. You know, um, maybe take a second to uh, what specifically swayed you uh, about the idea there and what's the idea? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, the idea of having uh, sort of um, nested representations in capsules and, and trying to learn the nested representations uh, I find this somewhat attractive just because um, you probably would expect some uh, logical connections uh, to be retrieved in such ways. So I decided to, to try to, to train a capsule network. And uh, so this uh, turned out to be relatively difficult uh, with uh, absolutely sort of naive uh, uh, architecture without uh, any pre-training. However, uh, using this uh, this uh, trick that that I've been talking about before, uh, with uh, embedding some uh, amnes data and training it together with, uh, or in a in a transfer learning sort of setting, um, 
uh, with virus data. That helped a lot, and uh, we got uh, pretty good results. Uh, uh, ResNet still uh, win, but uh, capsule networks are able to uh, train on even on such uh, wild data, if you, <laughs> as you mentioned. <laughs> Mm, interesting. Yeah. So the the way I tend to think about the capsule idea relative to CNNs, and and you tell me if this is uh, a horrible explanation or not, is I think of you know CNNs as being good at kind of this two dimensional translational invariance, uh, whereas capsule networks are um, designed to represent. Um, Kind of the structure within the 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 thing, the image in multiple in higher dimensions. Is that the main uh, thing that you you find interesting there? Or yeah, in, absolutely, in the... yeah. Uh, and yeah. I think that's uh, there is something in this idea because uh, just uh, doing some uh, convolutions and 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 pooling, uh, it's somehow. Uh, it, although it works remarkably well, and I don't mean to say anything about very. Uh, uh, clear and basic uh, convolutional neural networks. Uh, however, they there oh, has they to be still, more. It sounds to like that. they still outperformed uh, what you absolutely, ever yeah, practice. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, it seems like there should be something more to that. So, uh, you know, I choose to believe. <laughs> and and you know, when it comes to the the ultimate results that you saw. Is is the idea and, and kind of what is powering your belief and the promise of CapNuts? Is it that, you know, we with CNNs and I, I think you said you use ResNets, like we know how to scale the compute there and, you know, CapNuts, they're newer. Maybe we don't know how to scale the compute as well and, and make networks that are as deep. But um, fundamentally, if we could do with, caps nets what we are able to do now with resnets you would expect it to perform better is it that kind of thing where you know we're just kind of catching up in our ability to to compute i'm trying to to really get at the thing that you think holds uh you know holds so much promise given that it you know isn't working as well uh, yeah, so uh, I, I hope that exactly uh, as you suggested, uh, you know, if we able to scale the the uh, sort of network capacity required to to uh, address uh, certain problems, we'll we'll get uh, to um, you, we'll get the, to to we'll get them to work a little bit better than they do at the moment. Uh, and in principle, maybe it's not the uh, capsule networks in general uh, that will uh, work out in the end. Maybe it is also some other uh, approach that will uh, build upon this uh, premise that you know there's uh, more of a context that we need to try to inc include in multiple levels at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, is there, or is your work touching on um, kind of the, this inherent graph graphical nature of um, the underlying biological systems at all? Is that something that you uh, look at? Uh, not yet. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have uh, sort of capacity to, to look at this aspect, but I, I certainly think that, you know, there is uh, uh, only that many uh, questions you answer, you can answer with a binary classification problem, right? So there is definitely a necessity to go deeper into representing the, the uh, uh, knowledge that is uh, contained in, in in the massive bodies of uh, biomedical literature, for example, to try to understand the, um, uh, the complexity within that we that we have in the data. I mean, uh, from the point of uh, from probably the very first day when I started working with microscopy images, uh, I always perceived it as a sort of a ultimate uh, Rorschach test, if you will. It's uh, uh, you, you you get you get a you get a spot uh, like a white spot or grayscale spot in a in a black background, and you're trying to understand what is that thing. And uh, different people would definitely see different things. 
uh, in, in the same image. Uh, one, one person would be like, oh, what, what is that thing? Oh, somebody told me that's a, that's a cell nucleus. And another person will see chromatin there and a cell is about to divide. And, you know, there's a lot of information that uh, depends on the context and depends on your prior knowledge there. So obviously, as you said, I think as incorporating things like uh, knowledge graphs uh, into, into work like this would be definitely a way forward. And uh, that's, that's something that I uh, see developing in the coming years in the field. Mm -hmm. uh, and so maybe using that as a, an opportunity to, to zoom back out to AI and life sciences generally, um, we spend a lot of time talking about microscopy and that, uh, plays a big role in the field. Are you, you know, has your organization, um, you know, made any attempts to kind of map out the various ways that AI, you know, can or, or should impact, uh, life sciences and how far along, uh, we are in those various areas? That'll be uh, a thing to go for uh, that we that we have already discuss discussed with my colleagues, um, and unfortunately we haven't had uh, that much time to do that just yet. But I think, uh, in general, um, that, you know, going beyond just microscopy and images, uh, looking at the uh, there's a lot of research going on right now in the field of. Um, uh, molecular life sciences in general, uh, looking at the molecular structures or uh, sequences, uh, mm -hmm. protein sequences, DNA sequences, and trying to combine it with, uh, you know, basic techniques like same that is used in the in the fields of uh, natural language processing, for example, right, where you could uh, try to uh, use some generative approaches, for example, to see uh, or to predict uh, binding sites and uh, to predict uh, novel um, uh, conformations of molecules and so on. Mm -hmm. So this is definitely a, a great direction to, to start getting into. And uh, I guess uh, the way I see the, the mission for the, for the organization is that uh, we should uh, try to uh, bring the conversation uh, forward to, to uh, combining similar, similar to the way the, the, that life sciences are structured today. We need, we need to combine multiple sources of information revolving around uh, similar phenomena in order to uh, sort of uh, be able to, to, to push the discovery because uh, life, discovery in life sciences is never done uh, as a result of a uh, uh, single sort of method uh, that, that shows one thing. You, you always need to uh, reach out and, and try to uh, prove or disprove your concepts uh, using multiple methodologies. And uh, yeah, look at things uh, from, a, from multiple sides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is that fundamentally because what where the real insights are in life sciences is when we start to understand function and you don't just kind of see that in a one shot thing. It's it's based around a, a developing body of knowledge uh, that comes from looking at things in different angles. Absolutely. So uh, the thing is that um, most discoveries uh, made. Uh, not because uh, you know uh, you you see something unusual and that's a discovery. Uh, it's it's uh, it's quite in contrary. It's a rigorous process of um, uh, just trying to disprove uh, that that you made a discovery essentially in multiple ways mm -hmm. until you run out of ways to dis to disprove yourself. So uh, I remember when uh, I, I stumbled upon a, uh, a virus inhibitor uh, for for uh, which, which we published in 2017. Uh, it was using um, uh, biomedical imaging, the time lapse imaging of of uh, so called virus plaques. Uh, virus plaques are uh, when when you start the infection with one single cell, it shines green, and then you see that uh, the infection is spreading to neighboring cells, and uh, you get an idea what's going on with uh, with those cells. Are they mm. supporting the infection spread or not? And uh, I couldn't get it to work under certain conditions, and and it turned out that that one of the molecules I was I was keeping in my medium uh, was preventing it from from spreading, and and that's how you stumble upon. Uh, a discovery, but essentially, uh, to get from that point to the to the actual published paper, it took a uh, collaboration of multiple people and uh, multiple methodologies to to address uh, multiple aspects of of what's going on. Mm. Uh, is you know, to what degree are there um, 
hobbyist opportunities in, in life sciences? Like, do you have to have uh, the backing of a, a huge lab to kind of not necessarily make interesting discoveries, but even, you know, play with the, the data or are there, you know, things that folks uh, can, you know, do to, you know, to start to better understand uh, biology with, uh, you know, the tools that we have in neural networks and the, the data sets that have been made available? That's an excellent question. Thanks a lot. So uh, actually, I, I believe personally that there are massive amounts of, of hobbies opportunities uh, scattered around the field. Uh, there, is, there is simply not enough hands uh, in, the, in life sciences to, to get all these uh, advanced methodologies going and, and, and doing what they can do best. Uh, like like uh, fostering science, improving the accuracy of, of assays and so on. So um, I think that uh, you know that's that's one of the sort of main missions of the of the organization I'm trying to to build. Uh, it's to bring together uh, hobbyist researchers from all sorts of fields in order to see, okay, you know maybe there is a opportunity to to uh, publish paper here and there, and maybe the, there is an opportunity to make uh, advances. In and, and virology, maybe there is an opportunity to just get some uh, published data and play with it a little bit. So that's that's uh, one of the um, uh, goals of, of this work. And uh, in principle, there is really a lot of uh, data sources that maybe not many people uh, know about that they can uh, immediately work with uh, as uh, from a public domain. And uh, there are a lot of open problems. Uh, we just need hands. Awesome. Awesome. And so for folks that are, are interested in taking you up on that, how do they, you know, find you, connect with you, learn more about uh, the opportunities that are out there? Uh, go to ales.institute and uh, uh, join the forum, start a conversation, ask, ask a question. And uh, the idea is that we will connect you with uh, researchers who are actively working on this. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Arthur, thanks so much for taking the time to share a bit about what you're up to. Very cool stuff. Thanks a lot, Sam. It's a lot of fun. Thank you.